of spirit to worship you together with us this evening in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Well, good evening, Spectrum. It's good to be with you once again to worship our God together, uh, both here and online. Um, this evening, we open up this time singing the word Hosanna. And Hosanna, of course, carries that double meaning uh, of both that salvation has come as well as, Lord, please save us. Um, so let's sing this with that thought in mind that salvation already has come. Uh, and yet he still continues to sanctify us. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Our hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. Because when we see you, we find strength. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hear the sound of hearts returning to you. Return to you. In your kingdom. Broken lives are made new. You make us new. Cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away, oh, Hosanna. Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away, Hosanna. Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come out your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come out your way among us, we 
welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. Amen. In this next song, we remember the words of the psalmist in Psalm 73. Um, again, as he's, he looks over all that the world has to offer and enticing it as it may be, the psalm ends with that sweet and peaceful verse where he says, but as for me, it is good to be near to God. And so we sing that same idea, that same message, um, that our greatest desire is to just be close to God. safest song, louder than the echoes of my longing, purer than a wedding, better than an it as well, deeper than the oceans of my wanting, your nearness, oh, your nearness is my good. Your nearness, oh, your nearness is my good. Stronger, stronger than the enemy, greater than my unbelief, closer than the air I breathe, oh Jesus, your nearness, oh your nearness is my good, your nearness, oh your nearness is my good, be near, oh God. You're all I want, you're all I want. Open my heart to feel your presence and know that you are here. Be near, oh God, be near, oh God. Cause you're all I want, you're all I want. Open my heart to feel your presence. Know that you are here, your nearness. Oh, your nearness is my God. Your nearness, oh, your nearness is my God. than the honeycomb, sweeter than the honeycomb, safer than the safest song, louder than the echoes of my longing, purer than a wedding ground, better than a needle's well, deeper than the oceans of my wanting. Your nearness is 
He's my glory. Your nearness, oh, your nearness is my
Good to see you all this evening, and um, we have a very exciting announcement today. It's not exactly an announcement. Somebody is getting married from our church, and uh, since they are getting married in India, I think they are requiring them for uh, reading of the bands. Now, that's not a practice we usually do here. It's mostly in England, and also I think the church in India is now mandated to do this. So I'm going to read the first wedding bands for our own Vinay. All right, so here it goes. So our Vinay Kumar Rai, who is the son of Prabhakara Rao Rai from our church, is getting married to Sadhana Medipali, uh, who is the daughter of Krishnaya Medipali, from Rehoboth House of Prayer. And their wedding is scheduled to be on February 25th of 2022. It's um, happening at a place called Siddhartha Gardens and Convention Center in Guntur, Andhra Pradesh. And if anyone has any concerns or issues, uh, now is the time to make it known. All right, that's the official bands, but we can give a big round of applause to celebrate this and uh, also to pray for this dear couple as uh, they're preparing to get married in a very difficult time like this, as you know, some of you also probably went through and you know uh, even just a wedding is a big deal and doing it in these situations can be incredibly challenging. So shall we pray for Vinay and Sadhana, would you please join with me? Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we want to lift up this wonderful couple that you are bringing together and their families, Vinay and Sadhana, and even as they are preparing to enter into the covenant of marriage, I pray, Lord, that you will speak to each one of them, prepare their hearts and minds, and help them to comprehend the awesomeness of this covenant, and that they will enter into it uh, with joy and cheerfulness and dutifully and uh, knowing uh, the significance of what this is, not only for them, but for you. And I pray for all the preparations. I pray for their health, for both their families. Pray that you will protect them and keep them safe and uh, for all the arrangements in this constantly changing situations that they will be able to experience your presence and rest even through this, Lord. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. All right, and um, as I said, we've been, uh, we've, we've offered pr gift prizes for kids who are listening to the series and are sending their responses. I don't know if we have any of them to display. If we do, we can display them right now. And um, uh, th this is uh, something that always fascinates me when kids write what they picked up, not only from each week, but also a, their prayers are awesome to do. Do we have any this week, or if not? All right. And also the pictures are cool, right? So Adney's pictures on the creed. Um, so he has a question, how can God reveal himself by his names? Good question, Adney. We are going to start listening into it from today. All right. And who's next? <clears throat> He seems a little sad. Is he sad or happy in that picture? Can't exactly say that. So outside, inside, suppression of faith. I don't know what that picture is. Is that a boat going somewhere? Maybe I should ask him. So he wants to pray for food. Please feed him, parents. Give him good food. It's, I'm, I'm sad. Who's next? <laughs> That's it? Oh. All right. That's Jake. Wow. Wow. Um, he wants us to pray for his understanding of God. Sorry, Jake, I'm not able to read it here, but I'm just impressed how meticulously you're following and taking down the notes. So good job. Wonderful. Anybody else? Oh, wow. His brother is man of few words. He wants to pray for his health. Um, I don't have any questions? That's, that's pretty good. I'm 
Glad you don't. <laughs> All right. Anyone else or that's it? All right, can we give them a big round of applause? So glad our kids are listening and checking in. And if you guys have any questions about what you hear each week, please talk to your parents. And also you're welcome to come talk to me or your Bible study leaders. They will all be happy to answer that. So let's take a short break. And um, I know we all go by many names, right? Uh, especially if you were born and raised in India and then you moved here and you know, at work, at home, and how are kids? So, of all the names people call you, what is the name that you like the most to be called? You know, if you can think of that and go and share it with someone who's behind you or in front of you, we'll take a 60-second break, and then we will have God's Word read to us. Today's scripture portion is a psalm of praise to our Lord who endures forever. Psalm 135, verses 1 through 21. Praise the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord, who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel as his own possession. For I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain and brings forth the wind for, from his storehouses. He it was who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and of beast, who in your midst, O Egypt, sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants, who struck down many nations and killed mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land as a heritage 
a heritage to his people Israel. Your name, O Lord, endures forever. Your renown, O Lord, throughout all ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. The idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak. They have eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. O house of Israel, bless the Lord. O house of Aaron, bless the Lord. O house of Levi, bless the Lord. You who fear the Lord, bless the Lord. Blessed be the Lord from Zion. He who dwells in Jerusalem, praise the Lord. May the Lord add his rich blessings to the reading of his holy word. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this evening that we could all come before you and spend some time in quietness and restfulness and hearing from you, Lord, as uh, perhaps some of us are tired, some of us are fatigued, we're all exhausted from this pandemic and its effect it has had cumulatively over the past two years. Some of us are sick and recovering, and in all of this, there is only one place we can turn to um, where we know that from the depths of our soul we can be refreshed, and that is to see you and seek your face. And as we desire to do that this evening, I pray, God, that you will show up in a very special way for us that we may enter into this journey afresh, uh, leaving behind our preconceived ideas or thoughts, or perhaps even if there is any semblance of arrogance in us or familiarity, that we will come humbly before you like a child, eager to know you more and so that we can love you and worship you. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. You know, this pandemic has had an effect on a lot of different people, but the ones that it has affected the most seem to be the ones who are single and seeking to marry somebody else. So, one of the cool things that happened during the pandemic is... Um, People came up with innovative ideas and apps to connect people. You know, just this past week, I got a coaching on what are some of the latest trending apps for finding a life partner. You know, par several of you probably heard about eHarmony or you know, Christian Harmony, all these websites that will have detailed questions and you can, you know, they have algorithms that you can tell, hey, this is the kind of person I am, and this is what I'm looking for, and they'll try to match you up. And, and I think now it's shifted. Um, there are some new apps. You know, it's, this is not a plug for any of the apps, so I'm not endorsing any of them or condoning them. But you know, there's a CNB. If you don't know what CNB is, coffee and bagel. That's, that's a new training app. It apparently asks you, hey, say a few things you like about yourself or stuff like that, and you can read that about the other person and try to connect. And, and now there's even a newer one called Line, which I hear is trending and very popular. And if you want to know more about these, I know somebody who knows that, so you can ask me, I'll direct you to them. I am not an expert on these things. But isn't this fascinating that people are actually, when they want to get to know someone, um, this is how they are approaching it, right? And um, where you try to... S Know someone you have never met before, you never knew before, 
and you want to see if this can help you to take your relationship forward. Well, aren't we so glad it's not as cumbersome as that when it comes for us to know who God is? Because he has made himself known to us through his word and above all through his son, Jesus Christ. And so a little bit of recap today. We are going to continue in our series on creed, on knowing God. And, and what we saw last time was God reveals himself in two ways, right? And, and again, here are some pointers. If you watch the slide here, there's some blanks for you guys to fill. Can you have that slide? Yeah. So he, in outside, he reveals himself to everyone. And, and there, are, there are some characteristics that you can discern from God, from external things. And you can fill in that missing word. And parents, do not help your kids if they're doing it. Let's see if they remember it. I was impressed. Sophia remembered it last time when she was telling me in the middle of the week. I was like, that's pretty cool. And there are some other characteristics that you cannot find out about God just by looking externally, which he reveals internally to our hearts uh, through his spirit, right? And what we need to know about God, there are two ways you can know about God, as you can see in the next slide. One is through the names of God that we see in the Bible, and the, one of the names, the first self-descriptive name that God gives to himself is the one we are going to look at today, Yahweh. And secondly, through the attributes of God. Again, we spoke about two specific things about God's attributes. So if you guys know what those are, remember what those are, text them to me, okay? Or send me an email. And, and think of some other names that you know in the Bible that the Bible uses to describe who God is. Also, this is open for adults. It's not just a kids-only question or a trick question, okay? So today, um, um, we are going to look at how God reveals himself through the names, and we will go through uh, all the other things later on. And if you think about it, God does not actually need a name. He does not have to name himself like you and I do. But still, he graciously chooses to do that so that as his creation, we can try to understand and know a little bit of who he is. You know, a name is a big deal. Those of you who are parents, you probably remember very clearly with much excitement when you know that a kid is on the way, your baby is on the way, and you are starting to think about names. You know, you, as a husband and a wife, you have different priorities, prerequisites, and sometimes, you know, grandparents have a say in what the name is. You want that name to really mean something that is very unique, and you hope that the name that you give your child, the child will grow up to live up to that name, isn't it? I, I remember for us, it was such a joy to name all our three kids. You know, first was Carissa, and, you know, uh, that time I was just fresh off uh, learning Greek and very excited about that, and we wanted to name her as Grace, and, uh, and then realized it's such a common name. Everybody has the word Grace, and we thought about it in Tamil, which would have been Kirba, that also was a common name. And so we thought, hey, we'll give her the name for grace in Greek, which is Charis. And uh, we thought nobody will have that in India. We never thought we were going to live here. And now we find that it's quite a common name. There have been a lot of Charisas we've been running into, right? And same with Brian and Sophia. When we saw them, we were like, we wanted to give them a name that, you know, reflects who they are and what they can grow up to be. And... Um, and so for Sophia was the, the word, again, we wanted to keep it consistent with the girls. We didn't want the girls to fight about names, and we showed partiality. You know, Sophia is wisdom, that she'll be God's wisdom, and Brian actually means strength. You know, we saw he's going to be a strong boy. We wanted the Lord to be a strength. And so I'm sure you have your stories too, because names are a big deal. They, they communicate a lot. 
And isn't it interesting that God identifies himself with certain names in the Bible? And if you think about names, there are three kinds of names. There are proper names, right? Proper names are ones that are specifically given to people. Then, especially for God, like Yahweh and, you know, El Shaddai and all of those things. And there, and, and then, and there are titular names, you know, which are given that describe some characteristics of God. And then there are personal names of the Trinity, you know, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit about Jesus Christ. So today we're going to only talk about proper name of who God is. And, and so that's the part, I mean, I wanted to give, expand a little bit while we recap on that. But whenever we try to understand God, either through his name or through his attributes, we will immediately come to realize we have a limitation because we are creatures. And so there are three principles that we spoke about last time in how we approach this pursuit of knowledge of God because there is a separation between the creature and creation. And if you can have the next slide, again, let's see who remembers these three words that were there. God gives three, there are, theologians have come up with three categories in which we can try to perceive who God is. For as creatures, we are looking at our creator. And if you remember these, again, you can text them to me or email them to me, or if you have questions, we can talk about that. But I'm going to unpack this for us, you know. The first is by way of causality. And I'll talk about that in a little bit of what it means is where God, if he's our creator and we are the creation, there is something that is the cause of the creation and through which we can know him. Second is um, by way of... Um, looking at what are some characteristics that are in God's creation that are either there or not there in God. You know, because we are all created in the image of God. You and I, the Bible opens by saying God created man in his image. And the technical word it uses is theomorphic. We are, we are morphed or we, 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 we are in the uh, image of God. And, and he is the source of all creation. And therefore, God, however, to communicate to us, uses another aspect of communication, which we call as anthropomorphic. You know, he uses human terminology, uh, things that are familiar to human beings, and even anthropocentric, things that, are, that will make complete sense to us. You know, but there is a challenge in doing that because you have to make some distinction. And for that, these three principles are super helpful. You know, uh, you can take off the slide. What, what I was sharing about those were, first is causality. We'll come to that in a little bit. And second is uh, eminence. And third is negation or negativity. Eminence is like when, when you look at a creation... And you see something is beautiful, something is spectacular. You know, any perfections that exist in a created thing ought to have existed in the creator preeminently. So that is what you can infer. You know, if, how do we know God is awesome and holy and beautiful? There are things that he has created that reflect his awesomeness and holiness and splendor, like Paul talks about in Romans 1. Negation is the exact opposite of that, where we see we take away the properties that are there in the creature, which are not there in God. You have to make those distinctions very carefully. The former one is where whatever good we see the creature has, there's more of it in God. The latter one is whatever imperfections that are there in the creature, they do not seem to be there in God. And sometimes we end up, when we try to understand who is God, and the Bible uses human language and 
you know, uses how you feel and God feels and hands and feet and eyes. Even in the psalm we read, we are going to come to that at the end. It talks about all those characteristics God has. We can err on making the right connection if we don't apply these principles. And when we talk about causation, when God causes to create something, when God produces something, th there are two, kind, two ways in which something can be produced. You know, Thomas Aquinas is one of the early church theologians. He said, when God produces something, it is on, not on the same plane of being. For example, when when you say that, you know, Mr. X caused or produced a son who is also a human being, they are on the same plane. But God's causation, production, is not on the same plane. And if we start to apply it, for example, oh, God, I, I am in the image of God, I have anger, and then you read God is an angry God, he must be terrible because we try to project how we get angry to how we think God gets angry and therefore conclude that either God is so mean and that's what most people do. But the other way to think about it is you're producing something on a different plane. A classic illustration would be, you know, when I watch my kids, they build a Lego ship. Now, who built that? My kids built that. They caused it into existence, picking up the pieces. But you see, they're not on the same plane. So, as parents and children, there can be a lot of similarities by being similar, but in this case, it's different. So, when we talk of divine attributes, it's important to keep this distinction in mind. And now we'll come to the first name with which God identifies himself. And that name has only four letters in Hebrew. You know, you can see that in the next slide. It's the name Yahweh. In Hebrew, you do not have vowels, you know, so they have only consonants. And this is called the tetragrammaton. And he chooses, this is a proper name. You know, the name God is a class name. You know, it can be applied to anybody else, but Yahweh, God says, is his own name. And when Jesus teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, he begins by asking us to pray, hallowed be your name. And that name is this proper name. And it is a name we will see shared by all three people in the Trinity. Unlike the other names or other examples the Bible uses to say God is my rock or the lion is the lion of Judah, you see all these created things, this name doesn't have any external reference. It's, it's a very unique name to who God is. All other names are used to, through, by referring to some aspect of his creation, but this name alone, the self-revelatory name of God is very unique, which sets it apart. The best commentary to understand this name is actually the book of Exodus, the very second book in the Bible. Now, when God created man, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they could see God, they could hear him, they could talk to him, they could just be in his presence, and it was fantastic. And after the fall, we will see that when we talk about crea uh, the creation and the fall, man lost his ability to see God or to hear God. And then we know the sequence of things that happened in the book of Genesis, where the entire creation went into a downward spiral, and then you had the flood, and God started a new creation out of the flood, and then you had people who were descending from Noah, and, and even there things once again went bad. Finally, 
God calls his children and through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and their descendants end up in Egypt, and they seem to be so far removed from God at this point, from Eden, where they were created in his image, enjoying his intimacy, to now being slaves in Egypt under the Pharaoh. So now God wants to once again reveal himself to this people who seem to have so far removed from him, and so he sends Moses to let his people know who he is. And not only his people, he wants to let the whole world know who he is. So Exodus, sometimes maybe the name can take us in a wrong direction. We think, oh, it's about how God took people out of Egypt. That's not the central theme of Exodus. The central theme of Exodus is the self-revelatory name of God through which he wants to show the whole world how glorious he is. And that's what we are going to see. You know, I, I just want to pause here and remind everyone, as we are doing this series, we, we want to go to the Psalms at the end very briefly because the Psalms capture all these things we are going to talk about and it should help us in worship and praise. So I'm not going to exegete the Psalm verse by verse. I'll try to apply these when we get there. So how does God reveal himself in Exodus? And especially for our kids who are in Spectrum Kids, you've read those stories and and I want to take you behind the scenes and, and, and get a little deeper into this. It's fascinating what we read in Exodus where God takes Moses and says, I want you to lead my people out of Egypt. And for doing that, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 3. We'll read from verses 13 to 15. It says, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. This is the self-revelation of God to Moses. Moses is basically saying, what's your name, God? Why should they now come to you? First time, God gives himself a name. And it's a very unique name. And in fact, the name is actually not even a noun. It's a verb. It's the verb for to be, to exist. It's, a, it's actually a word play on the verb to be in Hebrew. It's unique. And there are three specific characteristics about this name. It is self-referential. He doesn't refer himself to somebody else. You know, you and I, our names are always in reference to something. You know, you have a last name that ref tells us, so he's either the son of someone or from a place where you are born. Or, or even you look at some people, oh yeah, there's, you know, there, there's some similarity and, and things like that. But for Yahweh, there's no external reference. It's also self-interpretive. God chooses to interpret his name without reference to anything, and it is also self-determinative. He determines what his name is and what gets accomplished through it. These are three self-attributes of the divine name Yahweh. He basically says, I am. It's very hard to put a time stamp on his name, you know, and there are places where it gets hard. And when you come to Revelations chapter 4, it says the one who was, who is, and is to come. That's Yahweh. It's, it's there from Genesis to Revelation in several ways. And 
And when you come to John's Gospel, we'll see more of it later. John applies this to Jesus Christ himself. Where he is the fullness of God's being. He uses a pair of sevens applying divine names to Jesus. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. And if you look at the Septuagint translation of it, it uses the Greek equivalent of Yahweh, which is Ego Ami. So what Jesus was telling was, the name Yahweh, which till the Old Testament times were exclusively used to refer to God himself, is his name too. And that's why people pick up stones. The Jews get mad because they want to stone him. And then he makes those beautiful seven I am statements, isn't it? But when he makes the seven I am statements, the I am's are not absolute, but they are predicates. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. He is the one who actually reveals this Yahweh to us in ways you and I can comprehend. He is the fullness of everything that is in God. Everything good we find in creatures we said exists supremely and excellently in God, isn't it? God created light out of darkness. He saw there was darkness and then out of his own light, he brings the light out. It's called ex nihilo, creation. Creation it was not creation out of nothing. It was creation out of the very substance and being of God himself. And then Jesus comes and says, I am the light of the world. You need physical light to move around and see things, but without me, without my light, you cannot understand anything about who God is or who you are. And that's now the word Yahweh, I am, takes on special significance in the light of the face of Jesus Christ. We need bread to sustain our physical beings. And Jesus comes and uses Yahweh phrase, I am the bread of life. Because he is the supremely essential bread for you and me to sustain spiritually. God is self-existent, as we saw. We all exist because of something else, but he is not. The Father has life in himself, and so does the Son have life, and he gives it to you and me. So from him, we get that. And Jesus goes on to say, we read about him in Paul. He says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's the New Testament equivalent of I am who I am. But you see, if you go back to Exodus, God just doesn't say, this is my name and let's Moses tell him. And people don't say, oh, okay, this is your name, I'm going to call you by that name. No. He actually starts doing some things that will show the people what the name Yahweh significance. They are going to see as the things of ex events of Exodus unfolds the infinite nature of who God is, and they are going to see the independent nature in which how He acts. The infinitude of who God is and the independence of His actions are going to show people what Yahweh really means. And why is this important to Moses and the Israelites? Why should they, when they hear this name, start trusting in this God and following Him? And why does God specifically say this name? It's very important to them because now they are in slavery, and it is going to be a consolation to them to know that this God who is now speaking to them through Moses is the same God who spoke to Abraham. He was, he's the same I am, who he is to them, was who he was to Abraham, and who he is to you and me today. 
which means that if he made a promise to Abraham, that promise still holds for us, and therefore we can trust him, and that promise still holds for you and me. Because his purposes don't change. That's the significance of I am. He says, my promises will be fulfilled. Do you know and believe and trust that I am Abraham's God? I am also your God, the same way I was to him. So God reveals his name through his infinitude and his independence in his being. He says, I am the same person in my being. I have not changed. He doesn't just leave them with that. Could have sounded to some as a pep talk. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, you said all these things, but look at who we are. We are right now messed up. We are as slaves. So he says, you don't have to just take my word for that. I'm going to reveal my infinitude and my independence, not only through my being, of being the same person, through my power. I'm going to show you what Yahweh means by my infinite, independent display of power, not just for you, but for the whole world to see. And that's what happens in Exodus chapters 5 to 7. If you really have your Bibles, turn to Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. It says, God sends Moses to Pharaoh and tells Pharaoh, let my people go. You know, Pharaoh gets cheeky and he tells, hey, who is this Yahweh? Why should I let you guys go? You know, verse 1 in Exodus 5, he says, Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? You see, whenever you see the word Lord in capitals, it's Yahweh. That I should obey his voice and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Wow. Here's the greatest king of the mightiest empire of the time. He's challenging Yahweh. And from Exodus chapter 5 to Exodus chapter 4, it's a running commentary a vivid commentary where Yahweh gets into action teaching this Pharaoh who he is. So in, in all these chapters, you're going to see, especially from chapters 7 to 14, Yahweh is going to perform certain actions before certain audiences through which they are going to know some attribute of who he is. And at the end of it, everyone will know the glory of Yahweh's name. In fact, you even hear towards the end, later on, when Rahab sees uh, the informer, she says, we heard about Yahweh's name. How did the world hear? They saw Yahweh's action unleashed. In, in Exodus 7, verse 5, it says, The Egyptians shall know I am Yahweh when I stretch out my hands against Egypt where I, they will see how I act independently and infinitely displaying my sovereignty. You know, verse 5, 7, it says, The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from them. And the summary statement is in the central part of Exodus chapter 9, verse 14. It says, For this time... I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and on your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. I will send plagues so you will know there is no one and I have tremendous power and control over creation. I can make what I want to see and happen in every single thing that I have created when I want to see it happen with whatever intensity I want to make it happen. I'm incomparable. I want to show you my power, Pharaoh, so that it will be proclaimed in all the earth. His being is infinite. His power is independent. And he says, you, Pharaoh, are actually part of my plan. In fact, for this reason I raised you, I'm using you to make my power and name known to all the earth because I am who I am. 
And so when Moses breaks into a song in Exodus chapter 15, in a summary, he says, Who is like you among other gods? You're majestic in holiness. You're awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. That's the central theme of Exodus. It basically reveals there is none like him and justifying his name. He just is. Yahweh's independence and infinity is exhibited in his unrivaled power. So God reveals himself in his being. He reveals himself through his power, especially to those who stand opposed to him. But there is a third way in which Yahweh reveals himself to his covenant people and children, including you and me, and that's through his goodness. That's the third thing you'll see on the slide. And you see that in Exodus 33 and 34. You know, when Moses meets God in Exodus chapter 3, he sees this burning bush. And you know, deserts are a very hot place, and burning bushes happen all the time because of intense heat. But this is a very different kind of a burning bush. As Moses has this encounter with God, as God reveals to him, the bush is not being consumed. One thing it reveals that God is not needing power from the elements he created to display himself. But there's also another thing, that God is not consuming this bush. And so the big question that comes in Moses' mind is, well, God is this consuming fire. How can this consuming fire dwell in the presence of a stiff-necked people who will keep rebelling and rebelling and rebelling, including you and me? Will we not get burned? Will we not get consumed? And there was a glimpse of this goodness and the grace of God in that burning bush when that bush was not consumed. No one had ever seen a God like that before. This God of infinite and independent in His being, infinite and independent in His power, is also a God who is infinite and independent in His grace and mercy and goodness to those who love Him, His covenant people. In fact, God threatens to destroy Israel, and Moses intercedes and asks God now in Exodus 33 and 34. He, he doesn't even know what to ask God for because, you see, when he goes up to get the Ten Commandments, the people already built a golden calf, a created thing, something that they were not supposed to do. And Moses' fear now is they, they are going to be consumed if God burns among them. But now he knows, he cannot even ask that, so, so he doesn't even know what to pray, and he says, God, show me your glory. Show me who you are. Maybe then I will know how better I can communicate and ask and pray. Because Moses knows no one can see, and God tells him, no one can see my face and live, so that, you know, you, I'm just going to pass before you, you should hide yourself in the cleft and I, you can see my back and then I will tell you who I am. God's saying for the first time, Moses, I told you what my name is in Exodus 3, in Exodus 33 and 34. I'm going to tell you what that name means, especially for my covenant people. That will help you understand who I am a little bit. And the sum and essence of that, we read in Exodus 33, 19 onwards, it says, I will be gracious to who I want to be. I will show mercy on who I will show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I show compassion. It's the same grammatical construction of 314. And if you read that chapter, you can go home and read it. It says, my grace extends to a thousand generation. I keep my love to a thousand generation. 
and my justice up to the third and fourth generation. You see the tremendous imbalance in that description of God? It says, yes, I am a holy God. And I am a just God too. My infinitude and my independence are displayed in both my love and in my justice, except my love is going to infinitely extend to a thousand generations, and my justice, because tempered by my grace, will only go to three or four generations. And so there is some hope for Moses to pray, and that creates in him an awe to worship God. He knows these are stiff-necked people, and if they go, God, God, they, God cannot go in their midst, but he pleads, God, these are a stiff-necked people. Will you go before us and lead us? Because he remembers that burning bush, just as how God showed himself through the burning bush and the bush was not consumed, he can do the same now, being amidst the people of Israel and showing his love and compassion to them without them getting burned. That's what Yahweh is. Mercy and justice, and we read in the Psalm 85, mercy and justice kiss each other. And that's where we see the name of God that we cannot understand fully, that even the Old Testament saints could not comprehend fully, was made vivid to us through Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. John 1.14 is the equivalent of Exodus 3.14. Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. It's the equivalent of Yahweh saying, I will show my love to a thousand generations and my justice to three and four generations. Isn't this awesome? God's infinite independence displayed in who is just as being who He is. God's infinite attitude and independence displayed through His power, especially on those who reject Him and who rebel against Him. But God's infinite and independent goodness revealed through His grace and mercy to you and me who are His covenant people. Isn't that awesome? That's who Yahweh is. And we have Christ who is, who was, who is, and is to come. The expression of God to us who reveals this God to you and me every day through His Spirit who abides in us. And when you get this understanding of Yahweh and you turn the pages of the Bible Every single page in the New Testament, when it says, who is this Jesus? You know, when it says, you believe in your heart that Jesus is the Lord and you are saved. The Lord. That's what the Lordship of Christ is. You can find Yahweh in every page of the New Testament as well. And that's the beauty of the gospel that this Yahweh came down to you and me. He not only had a name, now we took upon a form, and that was Jesus Christ. He not only came in our form and likeness so you and I can know Him. He died and rose again, and now His Spirit comes and abides in our heart and takes us into union with Him through which we can actually see things we have never seen before, comprehend things we have never comprehended before. And when you get this glimpse of the glory of God, what Moses could see only from the back of him, we can see in the face of Christ, that should produce adoration and worship. That's the sum and essence of knowing God. It's not just mere intellectual understanding and growth of a theology and doctrine, it should be about doxology and praise. So it's my knowing and growing in my knowledge of God, producing a life of worship is the question that you and I ought to have. And that's why I want us to turn to the Psalm 135. 
You know, this comes in the last book of the Psalms. You know, those of you who attended our midweek series know that, you know, you have these five books of Psalm. Each of them were different, written predominantly in different eras. This is a post-exilic Psalm where the Israelites learned their lesson. You know, God gave them Canaan, and they were still the same stiff-necked people. They were still rebelling. They were still doing all the things they were not supposed to do. Then he exiled them and put them under oppressive regimes, and, and yet he still didn't abandon them, and they cried and they pleaded, and you have the Psalms of Laman, and then he brings them back, and now they get it, sort of. And so here is a psalm they sing. It's a psalm of ascent that is sung when people are marching to worship God. And if you look carefully in the psalm, in these very few verses, the central theme and focus of this psalm is the word Lord. It happens 20 times. It's a very unique psalm in that it's a, it's a mosaic psalm, not like mosaic in the form of Moses, but it actually picks several things from all the Psalms before and other parts of Scripture and stitches them together to give us a picture of what does worshiping our Lord as Yahweh look like. And, and it says, when you comprehend and know this Lord, you will be praising Him like this. William Beveridge, who lived in the 16th century, when he, when he writes about Yahweh, the other equivalent word that we don't use mostly is the word Jehovah, writes this. It's a fascinating quote. It says, Jehovah, or Yahweh, infinitude, immensity itself in all things, to all things, beyond all things, everywhere, wholly, essentially, continually present, as Yahweh, His constancy, immutability, eternity itself, without any variableness or shadow of change, yesterday, today, and forever the same. In a word, when we think of the Most High God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we should think of Him as Yehovah, Yahweh, unity in Trinity, Trinity in unity, three persons, one being, one essence, one Lord, blessed forever. That is the, this is that glorious, that almighty being, which the psalmist here means when he says, praise ye the name of the Lord, because He is unchanging in who He is and what he does. Now that's what the psalm opens by saying. It says, praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Give praise, O servants of the Lord. It's not just enough for one person to praise him. Such a huge God demands the praise of all of his children all the time, and so it's appropriate to gather in worship to praise him. You know, that's the whole beauty of corporate worship is God draws more glory, more by a corporate worship than if just it was you and me in our closet worshiping Him. You will not be able to comprehend and give Him the praise that is due to His manifold attributes, but when we do it corporately together, that's how He gets glorified. So He says, give praise, O servants of the Lord. Sometimes we have this tendency, oh, let me skip those worship songs. Let's just go straight and hear God's Word. You know, I've done that sometimes when I'm traveling and visiting places, and you miss out. It's not about you. It's not about what you can get that day from the sermon or whatever you can use. It's about what we can give to this Almighty Lord. And then he lists almost five reasons why we need to praise God. The first, he is good, verse 2. How do you define good? Goodness exists only within God. Everything else you think good is very temporal and fleeting. It will be good for a short time and it's gone. But ultimate good exists within God. And, his, and, and, and when we think, oh, these are good people and you start having a relationship and you develop a friendship, it's just a matter of time. You will find out some of their rough edges that will tick you off. 
And especially if you're married, the longer you are married, the more you're going to see each other's sinfulness. And you thought, I thought this person was a good fit. You know, maybe line was wrong. Maybe coffee and bagel didn't get it. Maybe eHarmony messed up. The algorithm needed an update and they didn't update it. This person is no longer good. I thought he or she was good, but they're not. But you see, it's not going to happen with God. He is always good, all the time. All of Him is good. So we should worship Him. And one of the reasons today young people struggle to make a commitment to marriage is they are not sure if this is absolutely the right person. You will always marry the wrong person, as one of the marriage authors said. It's not my quote, somebody else, I forget their name. You will always marry the wrong person, no matter how hard you try. The sooner you get to that reality, the better it is for you. The only good person that's always going to be in your life is God himself. And if you try to get that from your spouse or your kids, you're going to end up in more and more disappointment. And when you realize, wow, so this God is good, he never changes. Even when I mess up, he still is good to me. Then I need to worship him and give him thanks. That's the first reason the psalmist says about his being. Secondly, the reason he says is because he chose Jacob. Verse 4, for the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel as his own possession. Mind-blowing. He chose you and me, it says, even before the foundation of the world, in spite and despite of who we are. You see, all these are not theoretical concepts. Because he is infinite and independent in his love, he has so much unchanging love to give you, which is not connected to you and me always being in the best of our behaviors. Because it is so independent, his choice to exercise his love, it is not dependent upon you and me keeping his law and observing it all the time. And you know, we know who Jacob was. He's not a great guy, even has this name of being a deceiver. But yet, look what he says. He gives his name to Israel. He says, this is my own possession. He names a nation after him. What an unchanging love Yahweh has. His love for you and me will never change, my dear friends. Maybe the world will keep measuring us and relate to us depending upon our performances and where we are and you know, how we look or how much we do or how much we make. But God doesn't. He loves you in spite and despite of your brokenness and fallenness, because he already chose you. Even before there was anything good or bad in Israel, God chose Israel. Read that in Romans 9. Third reason, he says this, because he is great. Verse 5, for I know the Lord is great, and our Lord is above all gods. We already saw this last time. What makes him great is the sum and essence of not only his being, but the essence of all his attributes together. The more you find him, the more you see, this is really a great God. Wow. God, I thought after I mess up this time, that is it. That's going to be the end of it. You're not going to want to have anything to do with me. I'm such a miserable person. And he says, no, I still love you. And it's not a just a pep talk thing he says to do that. He actually sent his son who became the burning bush for you and me. Except in this case, the burning bush where God showed up to Moses did not get consumed. But in this case, Jesus Christ was consumed by the wrath of God on the cross because of which you and I can experience the infinitude of his love. It was not cheap. That's what makes God great. He 
And fourth reason says we, we need to worship God is this unchanging power. Like how what he did to Egypt, the psalmist actually recollects three things. His power, unchanging power over his creation, unchanging power over his children, his unchanging power over those who reject him. He says, whatever the Lord pleases, he does. Verse 6, in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all the depths. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightning for the rain and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. The power of God in his creation. And his power on those who are against him, verse 8 onwards. He it was who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast, who in your midst, or Egypt, sent signs and wonders against Pharaoh and all his servants, who struck down many nations and killed mighty kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan, and gave their land as an heritage, a heritage to his people. You know, the two kings it mentions here, they were the first ones to attack Israel un absolutely unprovoked. Og, who's the king of ba Bashan, that was a nation of giants. And God just took them down by displaying his power. It was not just the Pharaoh who saw the power when God helped the Israelites to fight all the enemies who stood against them, however big they were, without using their strength, he showed his power to everybody. And that's the same God for you and me. I don't know what are the obstacles you are standing opposed today. Do you believe we have a great and mighty God who will fight our battles for us and you cannot and we have to let go and let God and He will do it because of His incredible love for you? Because that's the next thing the psalmist praises Him for. Verse 13 and 14, he says, Your name, O Lord, endures forever, your renown throughout all ages. For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants. And then he looks at those nations. It uses, again, the anthropomorphic language in an exact opposite term, contrasting the idols that man makes to who God is. He says, Idols of the nations are silver and gold. The works of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak. They have eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear. Contra contrast this with Yahweh who sees you, who hears our prayers. And in verse 18 he says, Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. We become like our idols even today. Isn't that the truth? What we have idolized, what we have placed above God will shape us, will influence us. What we end up thinking in the middle of our night, what we want to become more of or what we want more of in our life will make us like that. If that is anything other than God, that is going to make you and me to be bitter people, jealous people, comparing yourself constantly with one another and forgetting we have this absolutely awesome God and we need to have our eyes set on Him and Him alone. And he ends up in praise, the final three verses, calling everyone to bless the Lord. And just as how the burning bush was not consumed, but he let Christ to be consumed, you and I will never be consumed because of this awesome God, Yahweh. Does this produce an awe and worship in us? And that's why it's important when we talk about the names of God or attributes of God, we need to sit and dig down deeper into all the layers of meaning that exists. If we've just been running our entire Christian life with a superficial understanding of who God is, it is not going to produce a life of worship, which is the essence of what we do. Let's pray. Dear God, we come before you at this time with our hearts filled with gratitude. 
for your self-revelation to us, for giving yourself a name that is above all names. And that is the name of your son, Jesus Christ, where we read at his name, all knees shall bow and all tongues will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. It's towards that you are leading us and this world, that your lordship may be proclaimed over all the earth. Enable us, Lord, to first make you the Lord of our own lives, to let your lordship reign in our personal lives to begin with. And we are so grateful for what you did for us by consuming your son on the cross, your very own son, your only begotten son, so that we will not be consumed. And even as we participate in this communion before us, may those elements remind us of these awesome truths. The body of your son that was broken and his blood that was shed, which he told us the night before he was to be crucified. This is my body that is broken for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. And this is my blood that is shed for the remission of sins. Drink it in remembrance of me. So when we take part in this communion, help us to feel your presence right here in a very special way through this great mystery of participating in this communion, Lord. Help us to draw more in our union with you so we may conquer and mortify sin within us. If there is any indwelling sin that has beset us, however small or big it may be, whether it is of jealousy or bitterness or anger or rage or adultery or pornography or addiction or whatever it may be, Lord, anything that has come up or crept up in our life due to our allowing of an idol, our pursuit of something we thought is far more important than our pursuit of you, I pray that your Holy Spirit will reveal that to us constantly and consistently till we come back to you. And we need this reminder every week, Lord, because we are fallen and broken creatures and we tend to drift away. So I pray you will bring us back to you this evening as we take part in this communion. And may something real happen in our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this
conference coming up on February 25th and 26th. Uh, we encourage all the couples to register for it. It will have speakers like Gary Chapman. Uh, so please register it. The link is in our uh, church email. Also, the new building purchase project updates will happen on uh, Feb 15th at 8 p.m. There will be a Zoom link shared with you next week. Pray for offering. Dear Lord, we come to you with humble hearts. Thank you for revealing yourself to us with your goodness, your grace and mercy. At this time of offering, Lord, we pray that help us give a cheerful heart to give back to you from what you have given us. Lord, we uh, pray that you help us give our hearts, our time, our money for the benefit of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we end our time lifting up the name of our God.
and loving Heavenly Father, at this time we want to intercede for those among us who are sick and who are fighting um, various things in their life. We pray, Lord, for your healing touch upon them. We pray that you will strengthen them and help them to have a quick healing and recovery so they can move on with all the things they need to be doing with their lives. I also pray at this time, Lord, who are seeking your will and your guidance for their lives as they have looked into their lives and are at crossroads, whether it be about their career or their marriage or about their children and their future. I pray that you will reveal your plan and purposes to all of us who may be looking for it. We also pray, Lord, for those who have lost their loved ones in the past couple of years and are battling grief as they go through this. I just pray that your continued comfort will fill them and uh, help them, God, to hold on to you dearly in these times. And I pray at this time also for us as a church, as we have earmarked this year to have an emphasis on being a witness for you. I pray that you will kindle our hearts to uh, be there for someone who needs you in their life, Lord, that we can be a source of comfort for them or encouragement for them or of help to them in whatever ways they may be. And we realize this pandemic has created a pandemic of loneliness in people's lives. And may we be good friends to them, Lord, and uh, help us to get out of our own fears or comfort zones and to reach out and lighten up someone's day, even if it is through simple acts. And I pray that you will encourage us to do that. Now may the grace of God our Father and the love of His Son and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each and every single one of us. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for joining. Have a great and blessed week. And kids are already on their way to (laughs) Spectrum Kids.